Chapter 3 of The Story of Geronimo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Parker. The Story of Geronimo by Jim Keelyard. Chapter 3. It was the spring in the year 1846, five years after Geronimo's first raid. Ten miles south of the Arizona-Mexico border, Geronimo sat silently on the summit of a low hill. His knife was on his belt. His muzzle-loading rifle, powder horn, and bullet pouch were in easy reach. A red blanket was draped over his body, which was naked except for breech cloth, moccasins, and the warrior's headband that bound his black hair. Two young warriors, Zaigo and Pedro Gonzalez, sat beside him. Both were older than Geronimo, yet both had chosen to let the seventeen-year-old warrior lead this raid into Mexico because of his cunning and courage. Now they were a little uneasy because of their leader's silence. Usually Geronimo loved to talk, and he was already a leading orator among the Membreno Apaches. When he was least talkative, he was most dangerous. Finally, Zaigo said impatiently, We sit beside the youngest Membreno Apache ever to become a member of the Council of Warriors. Yet he sulks like a scolded child. It ill befits him. I, Pedro Gonzalez, agreed. Since leaving the Membrano village, Geronimo, you have smoldered like a fire that is not quite able to burst into flame. Is it because some warriors spoke against you when they met to determine whether you might be admitted to the council? I care not who speaks against me, Geronimo said sourly. Any who consider me unworthy of being a Membreno warrior, I'll fight gladly. Those who did not want to admit you to the Council of Warriors never questioned your bravery or your skill in battle, Zaigo said quickly. They said only that you are reckless and headstrong, and that trouble goes where you do, because you never reckon the odds. There are some Membreno warriors who have the cowardly souls of Mexicans, Geronimo grunted, and I do not mean that you are a coward, Pedro. Pedro Gonzalez said quietly, Mexican I was once, Apache I am now. That was true. Captured in Mexico when he was five years old, Pedro had been adopted by an Apache family. He had taken so readily to Apache ways that he was now one of their finest and fiercest warriors. He spoke again. If you care not, because some spoke against you, what is the trouble? It is no pleasure to go raiding or anywhere else with one who does little except stew in his own anger, Geronimo said bitterly. Neposé was one of the men who spoke against me. The father of Alope does not like you, Zaigo said, but that is no news in the Membreno village. Neposé does not care to have Alope marry a mere warrior when it is possible that a chief will offer five horses in exchange for her. For a moment Geronimo did not answer. For five years he had watched Lope become lovelier each year. Her image accompanied him wherever he went by day, and haunted his dreams by night. He was as deeply in love as a young man can be. He said finally, When I became a warrior in full standing, I went to Nopose and asked for Lope. He sneered at me and said to come back when I could offer ten horses for his daughter's hand. Ten horses, Zaigo said in astonishment. 
That is unheard of, even for such a bride as her Lope. What do you intend to do? Pay for my bride what she is worth, Geronimo said. That is why we are in Mexico, where there are plenty of horses for the taking. He spoke more easily, for talking about his troubles had made them seem less. Zaigo and Pedro Gonzalez smiled, their white teeth flashing in the darkness. Now you talk as the leader we hoped we were following, Pedro Gonzalez said happily. Of course there are plenty of horses in Mexico, and when it comes to stealing horses, no warriors are more clever than Geronimo. You shall gain the price of your bride. I shall have the price, or I shall not return to the Mambrino village, Geronimo vowed. And I know we shall return, for we go against Mexicans. I think it must be true that something in the food they eat or the water they drink turns the marrow of Mexican men's bones to jelly as soon as they become men. Captive Mexican women fit very well into our tribe, as do children if taken young enough. The men do little except tremble with fear, and that is why it is better to kill than capture them. Pedro Gonzalez laughed joyously. It is long since I have fought Mexicans. Let us hope this is a good fight. They curled up in their blankets and slept. The night was still black about them when they rose to go on, traveling at a loose-legged gait that covered the ground with amazing speed. They were many miles from their camping place when the sun rose. They stopped to nibble parched corn from pouches that hung at their belts, rested less than five minutes, and went on. Geronimo who had been this way many times and who also had a splendid sense of direction, led the others through steep-walled canyons and over brush-grown hilltops. By mid-afternoon, they were looking from the top of a hill down on the ranchiera they intended to raid. The house and other buildings were built of adobe or sun-dried brick. To one side were extensive corrals made of poles that had been laboriously hauled from some river bottom or other where trees were plentiful. There were about fifty horses in the corrals. The three Apaches crouched in the brush and bided their time. They were heedless of the sun that burned down upon them. Thirst that would have driven a white man mad bothered them not at all. They were trained to endure thirst. An hour before dark, several Mexican riders came with a herd of forty horses. They put them in the same corral where the fifty were already confined, and turned their own saddle mounts in with them. Two more riders came, stripped saddles and bridles from their mounts, and shut them in the corral. Then all the Mexicans went into the house. Night fell before the three Apaches stirred. Geronimo gave his orders. Zaigo and Pedro, keep those in the house from coming out. I go to the corral. Geronimo slipped away in the darkness. He could no longer see the corral, but his sense of direction was so sure that he went exactly to it. The Mexicans had draped their saddles over the top rail and hung their bridles on the saddle horns. Taking no saddles, for all three raiders were expert bareback riders, Geronimo looped three bridles over his shoulder and entered the corral. The horses snorted in alarm when they got his sense, then wheeled to run to the corral's far side. Geronimo did not hurry, even slightly, for in the first place any quick move would frighten the horses. In the second place, with Zaigo and Pedro Gonzalez watching the house, he was not afraid that the Mexicans would come. In the third place, Geronimo had done this so many times that he knew exactly how to go about it. Presently, he backed a group of horses into a corner of the corral. Geronimo caught one, held it by looping the reins of his three bridles around its neck, and bridled it. He mounted. 
At that moment, a stallion screamed. The door of the house was flung open, but when Zaigo's rifle spoke, the door was slammed shut quickly. Still refusing to hurry, Geronimo caught and bridled two more horses. Sitting his own mount and holding the reins of the other two, he whistled shrilly. Zaigo and Pedro Gonzalez appeared out of the darkness. Not speaking, for each knew exactly what he must do, they mounted the two bridled horses. Geronimo opened the gate, and the three drove the herd through. There were hundreds of other horses grazing on the vast acreage of the ranchiera, but this was the only herd kept near the house, and the raiders had been careful to take all of them. The rest were miles away at other water holes. Even if the Mexicans recovered their wits immediately, they would still need hours to get more horses and launch any kind of pursuit. The raiders drove their herd towards Apache land at a leisurely walk. On their return, Geronimo gave Nepose twenty fine horses. It was a gift so dazzling that even Magnus Coloradus, giant chief of the Membreno Apaches, came to inquire about it, and Nepose could no longer forbid Alope to marry the brave young Geronimo. Several thousand people lived in the Membreno village, but since most Apaches liked plenty of room between themselves and their neighbors, the village was spread over several hills. Geronimo and Alope, however, built a fine wikiup near the house of Geronimo's widowed mother. Alope decorated it with pictures while Geronimo brought the skins of elk, deer, antelope, puma, and other creatures that fell to his hunting arrows. There were no bear skins because bears are sacred to Apaches. The following twelve years were probably the only truly happy ones Geronimo ever knew. A daughter came to live in the wikiup, then a son, then another daughter. It was a full and wonderful life for all. End of chapter 3